If you could kind of introduce yourself, um, and, you know, state your name, your position, company, you know, all the kind of vital statistics there. I'm Angela Whitaker Williams, and I'm with Perkins and Will. I actually opened our Austin practice of Perkins and Will, and um, uh, I'm a principal there over our education studio. So one of the things that uh, some of the background that I got from you is that uh, you believe that great design is about people and relationships, context and experience. Uh, I was wondering if you could kind of explain that a little bit further. Well, sort of the essence of design and architecture has always been about people. You build buildings for people to occupy. Even when you build them for animals, that's for people's view of animals, but that's another story. Um, but so the spaces that we build about people reflect their priorities. It reflects their interest. It reflects their desired use. And it's a physical manifestation of their attitudes towards a variety of things, from education to health care to wellness to civics, history, politics, and, and the environment. So um, when we think about um, sort of the organization of the site and site context, that's sort of something that's taught in, in architecture school, like how does the site relate to your building? But the site also is grounded in a place that has its own culture, relating back to people, relating back to what's around it and the context in which we're creating our environments. And really, truly great architecture is about experience. Um, if anyone's been to a really magnificent space, they, they carry it in their heart. They remember what it felt like to be there, what it smelt like, what, what their memories of that place become even bigger than the place itself. So true, really great design carries with it the experience of being there, and that experience becomes part of your life experience. So how did you develop this kind of uh, philosophy and approach? And I wonder if you could... Um, kind of give some examples of some of the uh, things that you've worked on, projects that you've worked on that kind of reflect that sort of philosophy. So the sort of people-centered humanistic side of architecture is always sort of taught in architecture school. You know, what is the scale of your figure relative to the space you're building? And is it grand or is it small? Um, how do you want people to feel when they're in that space? But really understanding the way relationships work in terms of architecture as a driver goes on all levels. It starts with, you know, what is my relationship to the client? Are they comfortable talking to me? Are they comfortable sort of revealing the kinds of information that gives our designers real inspiration? And then it goes into relationships of the way that we arrange spaces also allows for people to connect or to be separate. This department needs to be separate from that department or this group of people need to be real collaborative and have a mixing zone here. So really our spaces inform the way relationships work within the building itself as well as our relationships in designing the building inform the, the smoothness of the process and the degree of collaboration between the owner, the design team, the stakeholder team, the contractors, all of those people in great communication and great relationships give you even greater opportunities in the design process. Yeah, so you're, you're talking a lot about relationships um, and the importance of relationships um, between you and your clients and then the, the relationships between um, the, the structure and, and the, the people who will be occupying it, using it, and so forth. Starting, I guess, with the, the relationship with your clients, and, and you talk a little bit about, or the information that I got was talking about you, how you enjoy kind of learning about what drives your clients and you know, what their kind of goals are and interests are, and I imagine that's part of the relationship building process. I guess, how do you, um, how do you cultivate those relationships, or how do you make sure that you know, you're getting the the best possible relationship between your, you and your client, which then results in better work, right? Um, I would say we recently completed a high school uh, for Maynard ISD, and that high school, uh, the district was really kind of struggling with getting students career and college ready. And they were like, in this conversation with us, you know, we asked people, you know, what are your goals? What are your aspirations? And their goal was, I want every student to walk across the threshold and grab their diploma and some college credit at the same time. And they were really bold and being comfortable enough to say that to us because a lot of people don't like to sort of admit where they um, may have uh, struggles. 
And we were able to translate that in the building to um, creating environments where there were mentors coming in to help support students. Walking in the front door was the College and Career Center right as you enter the building so that students had their college and their career like on the front of their brains every day they walked in and out of the school. So some of those real like dialogues that came out of this trust really get translated into physical forms and into the way you experience things. Okay. So talk a little bit about uh, some projects that you've, uh, you know, whether they're recent or uh, less recent, doesn't matter, but, you know, how that um, kind of process has kind of manifested in the final work. Um, I would say we recently completed a high school uh, for Maynard ISD, and that high school, uh, the district was really kind of struggling with getting students career and college ready. And they were like, in this conversation with us, you know, we asked people, you know, what are your goals? What are your aspirations? And their goal was, I want every student to walk across the threshold and grab their diploma and some college credit at the same time. And they were really bold and being comfortable enough to say that to us because a lot of people don't like to sort of admit where they um, may have uh, struggles. And we were able to translate that in the building to um, creating environments where there were mentors coming in to help support students. Walking in the front door was the College and Career Center right as you enter the building so that students had their college and their career like on the front of their brains every day they walked in and out of the school. So some of those real like dialogues that came out of this trust really get translated into physical forms and into the way you experience things. So back up a little bit and, and talk a little bit about, um, you know, kind of how you got to where you are. I mean, what what uh, made you decide you wanted to become an architect and, you know, what were some of the influences, either uh, people or events or things kind of along the way that kind of uh, spurred you along? There's probably a series of them. Um, I would say my dad was a big influence. He was a firefighter in Dallas and um, he always, on his days off, we would hang out in the garage and make things. So I spent a lot of my youth growing up with power tools and band saws and all kinds of stuff. But when I was in high school, I had a little summer job working in a frame shop. And there was a guy who came back from architecture school. And he had this beautiful handwriting like architects do. And he started showing me the work they were doing at school. And it wasn't like what school experience was for me in high school. It wasn't scantrons and write, written papers, it was models and all this stuff that was very experiential and, and that had color and graphics and stuff to it. And quite honestly, I was like, that's for me. That's what I want to do forever. So that was kind of what launched me there. It was a casual conversation with somebody who was in it. And that's really how we pull people into the profession, get them the exposure. You know, as we think about kind of upping kind of the presence of architecture in the community, one of the best resources is to get young people exposed early. Okay, great. So um, talking about, uh, you know, women in architecture, I mean, talk a little bit about the environment, the architect, the industry or the, the categories um, environment and how that, you know, maybe has changed, um, if it has changed over the years uh, for women? I definitely think it's changed, at least it's changed over for my generation. <laughs> so uh, when I decided to become an architect, I had no clue it was a male-dominated profession, and quite honestly, I didn't care because it seemed like the great mix of science and art and making stuff that I always <laughs> loved. So I just went in full steam ahead. Um, my uh, first college experience was at Texas A&M University, and I was one of three females in a graduating class of 500 males, which also didn't bother me because I liked hanging with the guys, and it was a lot of fun, and it never crossed my mind that that was an issue until I got in the workplace, and in the workplace it became a different story. Um, but I enjoyed hanging out with the guys. I'll tell you the other story. Uh, the three girls who graduated with me, I'm the only one still in architecture. The other two are also leading other firms. One is in IT and one is in software design. So we all took our design thinking skills and took them someplace great. But, um, but I think that that kind of statistics looks very different today. So even as I fast forward and went to graduate school, I went to Tulane 
and I had a woman dean whose goal was to, to get more women in the profession and the College of Architecture there was 65% women. Which So in just those five years things shifted a lot and as I moved into the workforce I always realized that I was in a very male dominated profession and occasionally would be called on to do roles that were traditionally female. Oh, well, can you answer the phone? You know, that sort of thing. Um, but I always felt the need to prove myself more than maybe the guys next to me, so I did. Um, but I think as a whole we're still a little behind in balancing the gender gap for women and men in architecture. Um, if you look at sort of uh, what the NCARB, which is the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards, there's only 35% of women who are achieving a license. And over time, there's less than 20% maintaining that license. So if they are getting licensed, they're somehow dropping out of the profession. And it's still a fairly low percentage of who's getting licensed relative to the stats of who's in architecture school, which is closer to 50 to 60%. So really figuring out ways that we can hold women in the profession is really quite critical and quite important. Um, Right now, if you look at the statistics for women in sort of middle management positions, it's getting close to about 60, 60 40 to 50 50, depending on the size of the firm. Um, but I would tell you honestly, Perkins and Will is a bit of an anomaly in all of this. Um, we are a firm that very actively recruits diversity, and we're very conscious of how we do that. Um, we're also we're always looking for the best candidate and the best skill set, but we look for also ways to create an environment that's appropriate for diversity. By the way, we handle our recruiting. By we ha by the way, we handle benefits, retention, having really family centered benefits, and also looking at the ways that we do promotions. Really making sure that it's not the loudest person in the room, but the person who's really putting in the most effort. It might seem like an obvious question, but why is all of this? Why, uh, why is it important to bring uh, women or anyone, for that matter, uh, young women, young people? into uh, careers like architecture or even related careers like uh, structural engineering or you know the kind of this sort of the side uh, careers that kind of go along with architecture why do you feel that that's important so i i do believe it's really important to have women in the profession uh, women bring an amazing ability to multitask they have high levels of social and emotional understanding and they create atmospheres where people feel included and where Honestly, there's a little bit different communication style that helps people really draw together. We have some really amazing women leaders at Perkins and Will, and we have amazing middle management and intern uh, women in the practice who really contribute in ways that elevate the entire team. Um, sometimes, um, honestly, it's more than women. Um, the profession needs diversity in general. So if part of our job is to sort of translate the needs of people into reality, into their dreams, their vision, and the reality, their vision is through a very diverse lens. And we as a design group, or as a design profession, need a diverse lens to be able to reflect on that. So it's more than just women, it's all kinds of diversity that's required for us to really take a variety of life experiences and use that lens by which we hear things, translate those type ideas, and make them culturally appropriate for all people. The one question you didn't ask me that I want you to ask me is how do we draw okay. women into the profession? Okay, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great, uh, great question and uh, go ahead and uh, uh, answer that for me. You know, like I told you how I was drawn into the profession, it starts at a very young age and it starts by being exposed to what it is to be an architect or what it is to make things or, or why science and math are important, you know, why is geometry important. And oftentimes those are very abstract things at the point that students are learning them and so they they honestly need more exposure to architecture and to people in the process of doing architecture. I do a lot of work with K-12 and one of the things that we absolutely love to do is put children on our steering committees so that their ideas pop up. 
Usually the first thing we ask them is, what do you want in the building? They'll say, better cafeteria food. And, and the second thing they'll say is, I really want a space for fill in the blank. I'm, I like being out by the tree. You know, they'll say really insightful things that then translate into the work. And the other thing we like to do is bring them into our office for being an architect for the day and have them see what architects do day to day, have them work.